Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Joe Butterfield, Academic Advisor for the Undergraduate Certificate in Human Rights. I'm also an Adjunct Assistant Professor in the UI Department of History and Gender, Women's and Sexuality Studies. I'll be hosting today's conversation. The UI Center for Human Rights is housed in the College of Law, but our work is interdisciplinary. Throughout its 20 plus year existence, UICHR has been committed to educating both the campus and broader community about the human rights challenges we face and to exploring and developing via a human rights lens, concrete solutions to our most pressing problems. Today's webinar is the final one in the Center's Human Rights and Gun Violence series. This series has explored the opportunities and challenges of framing gun violence as a human rights issue. The 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights set forth a specific right to a social and international order in which it is possible to secure and enjoy the other rights and freedoms articulated by that foundational document. Research like that which we're going to hear about today explores how new data sets might help us understand the causes of gun violence. And it could be a first step in helping us towards securing that safer, less violent social order. Before we begin, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the shooting on the University of Virginia campus last night and to send our deepest condolences. These go out to all of those impacted. Indeed, today's webinar, during it, we will focus on mass shooting incidents that are becoming seemingly increasingly less rare. The scholars sharing their research for this webinar examine why it's so challenging to work with data on mass shootings, including their frequency. And at the end, we'll talk about how cultural ideas about gender, specifically masculinity, might help us to better understand ways in which we might support a less violent culture. I'm gonna to begin today by briefly introducing our distinguished panelists. And then after introductions, I'm gonna hand it over to them to share their research. We'll have time for Q&A at the end. So all of you attendees may ask the panelists to elaborate, clarify, et cetera. Please feel free to submit your queries to the Q&A at any time throughout the webinar. So first, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Professor Tara Tober. Tara earned her PhD from the University of Virginia. She is currently a lecturer in the sociology department at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Tara is a so cultural sociologist who studies the way we navigate difficult paths and events. Currently, her research centers on data collection on mass shootings in America, as well as an analysis of media coverage of these events and official responses. Next, we have Professor Tristan Bert Bridges. Tristan is an associate professor and vice chair of sociology at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and faculty affiliate with the Feminist Studies Department. Tristan has published widely on the shifts in the meanings of masculinity in contemporary US society and the diverse consequences associated with these transformations. As part of this, he has studied communities of men bodybuilders, feminist men's groups, fathers' rights activists, the enduring relationship between masculinity and sexual prejudice, American couples with man caves in their homes, gendered and sexual biases in America's search on google.com, and why mass shootings are so disproportionately committed by men in the United States. Presently, he also serves as co-editor of the interdisciplinary and international journal, Men and Masculinities. Tristan, Tara, welcome. Please join me. Great. Thank you so much. And I'm going to go ahead and get myself off the screen and let you begin to share. Thank you, Joe, for organizing. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all for coming to this. Um, I would like to start, um, Joe mentioned the shooting at the University of Virginia, um, you know, to mention that we are discussing a really difficult topic. And Increasingly, whenever um, Tristan and I give a talk like this, we know that there may be people in um, the audience who have, you know, who are survivors or who have been 
you know, for lack of a better word, directly impacted by some of these events. But we also know that even if you do not have a close relationship with any of these events, they can be um, mentally and emotionally difficult, um, you know, to the these the, these news events are incredibly difficult. And when we're taught, you know, and in this talk, we'll be discussing numbers and data. But of course, though, that these data represent people and humans whose lives um, have been, you know, impacted by this. Um, so do we have um, our PowerPoint? Okay, great. <laughs> So we're going to be talking about our data collection project on mass shootings. And um, so we can start with, actually, if you wanna to go to the next slide, yeah. Um, so whenever sociologists start talking about anything, the first thing they have to do is define it. And um, what Tristan and I, as we started becoming interested in mass shootings, because you know, we noticed that they, in our own lives, that they, were, they seemed to be happening more and more often. And as we started discussing these events as they, when we were um, in graduate school, we sort of wondered, well, as there were these debates about mass shootings, we thought, well, how many are there? And it turned out that nobody had really, you know, there wasn't really great data on this. And that much of the research was using existing definitions um, that were incredibly limited, right? They they sort of use this very um, this very narrow definition. And so, when we wanted to um, when we wanted to know answers to very basic questions like how many mass shootings happen in the United States each year, and the other, I think very sort of simple question that we should be able to answer. Um, are they increasing, right? Are they happening more often today than they were 10, 20 years ago? We realized that we didn't have really good answers to these very basic questions. And part of that was in was with concerning issues of mass shootings and their definitions. And really, if you can't answer basic questions like how many are there and are they increasing, then you're also unable to answer larger questions, right? Like how do we prevent them? What can we do? How can we solve um, this social problem? So we sort of set out to say, to, to sort of do our own data collection and come up with our own definition of mass shootings. So the problem with existing definitions is that they were that many scholars were relying on what we think of as the FBI definition, the FBI's definition of mass shootings. And this definition involved um, it was sort of very limiting because they they defined mass shootings as something that was an act that was committed by one shooter in one place in one period of time. And it excluded um, domestic violence or family and intimate partner violence. And it also excluded gang or drug related violence. The final limiting um, feature of this definition is that in order for it to sort of count as a mass shooting, there had to be four or more fatalities not including the shooter. So this is a an, this is an incredibly narrow definition. I'm sure those of you in the audience can think of examples of you know sort of mass shootings that we all have heard of that wouldn't fit that definition. So for example, the Columbine shooting um, in the late 90s, 1999, had two shooters, or the Virginia Tech shooting. Um, that happened in the early 2000s sort of happened over a long period of time in buildings across campus, so in separate locations, for example. And finally, the Sandy Hook shooting um, at the elementary school began with family violence at his home, and he then traveled to the school. So you had more than one location and an incident that started with family violence. 
using this very limited definition, um, the U.S. experiences about 21 to 35 mass shootings a year. And so this is not, you know, a, this is a fairly small number, but it is important to note that even, you know, this small number is much more, right? There's much more shootings in the U.S., even using 21 than anywhere else in the world. So even if you use this narrower definition, right, there's far more shootings in the United States than in other places. And there are also some reasons for this lack of data. You know, we think about where we know, <laughs> we know exactly how many people have had COVID, for example, or who have had the flu this year. Um, and so it seems kind of, you know, it seems surprising that we don't actually know how many or, or have difficulty agreeing on how many mass shootings there have been in a year. Um, and there is actually, and I can take some of the, I can address this in the, the Q&A, there's some reasons for this, for this lack of data as well. Um, okay, so we can go to the next slide. So um, when we set out to do this project, we relied on the initial work of the Gun Violence Archive. And what they do is they collect, they have a much broader definition of mass shootings that we, um, that we agree with. And so we include anything with one to two shooters. For us, one of the major differences is we um, include four, we do not have um, a fatality threshold. So for us, um, if there are four or more gun-related injuries, that counts. So when you look at data, you can see that there are lots of examples of cases where many people were shot, but not very many people died. And so to us, have you know this four fatality threshold it was actually reduced to three later the fbi's definition changed um barack obama's after sandy hook encouraged it to be um changed to three instead of four but even still that felt um that feels pretty arbitrary so there's examples of you know six or seven people being shot in a shopping mall and nobody dying but that does not count as a mass shooting so we decide we use gun related injuries for or more gun related injuries instead of fatalities. We also include um, gang or drug related violence, and we also include family and intimate partner violence. We also include spree killings, which are those killings that happen in multiple locations where maybe um, a shooting happens at home and then the shooter goes to a separate location and continues shooting. And so this um, is a much broader definition that includes much more data. So this means that between 2013 and 2019, our data set consists of approximately, you know, over 2,500 incidents, right? Compared to the much smaller number used with the narrower definition. Um, and the reason why we decided to do this is we didn't think there was a, we sort of, as we were doing this research, we discussed a lot about in, whether or not we should include gang related, gang and drug related violence. Um, and we've sort of, you know, people have asked us that question, like, why would you include that? You know, it's sort of equating, you know, what happens at, um, you know, a mass shooting in a, in a school, for example, with, you know, is gang violence really the same thing as that? But we sort of decided that gang violence is something that is relatively ignored right, in, in the media, um, it's, it's sort of a problem that I think not many people um, worry about or are seeking to address. Whereas these, um, you know, mass shootings narrowly defined do get a lot of press, they do get a lot of attention. And so we um, thought that this would be a great opportunity, right, to sort of shed some light on this type of violence. And so, it's possible then, right, when we you have when you're collecting a lot of data to then be able to address 
how are these different types of um, mass violence similar, right? How are they different? What are the different causes and consequences, right? Are there similarities? Once we have collected all of this, we want to look for patterns in this data or in these data. Um, so we're sort of, we think that we argue, right? That it is better to have more. And so that will enable us to look for these various patterns. Okay, um, so all of the work that Tara just mentioned means that we were able to double check, validate, and add a host of new variables to a new data set that helps us to expand our understandings of what mass shootings are on a scale that really hasn't been possible previously. In this slide, you're watching a time-lapse video of mass shootings in the United States over a seven-year period showing the data that we've coded and cleaned. This is the 2,543 mass shootings that happened between 2013 and 2019 that Tara just mentioned. I've always felt like it helped to fully appreciate the scale of the problem by seeing what over 2,500 separate incidents looks like on a map. And of these 2,543 2, incidents, more than 2,500 of them were committed by a man or men acting together. But even here, that's only one figure. That's the number of incidents in the data set. In terms of the number of victims, there are 13,562 victims of gun violence that aren't fully represented when we look at the incidents as singular events. And more than 13,500 of those victims were victimized by shooters who are men. And all of those 13,562 people have families and friends and colleagues and neighbors and more, and those people are affected by mass shootings too. There are about 380 million people in the United States today. And when you compare it to that, 2,543 can sound like a small number, but it's enough that it isn't uncommon for Americans to have some kind of a relationship with mass shootings. Some of you have probably endured active shooter drills in your schools, the way Tara and I might remember duck and cover drills when we were kids, or your children or grandchildren have experienced things like these. Mass shootings are so common in the United States that Tara and I classify them by type, and the media participates in this too. Mass shootings in the US are often distinguished by location, and in the US that means we have school shootings and workplace shootings and church shootings, and those incidents that sometimes get referred to as random mass shootings and lots more. And what our data allow us to do is look for patterns that are just much less possible with the small samples that are typically used to study mass shootings in the US. Because of the way that they have been defined by scholars studying them, many incidents are outside of our awareness because they don't meet the narrow criteria for being considered. And it's kind of tacitly assumed that those mass shootings that meet those narrower criteria are different from the rest. But a data set that includes all of those that we include here allows us to conduct an analysis and ask the extent to which that's actually the case. I know this one's complicated. <laughs> I'll walk you through it. Um, this is from an article we currently have under review along with our research assistant, Melanie Brazel. We've examined five of the most popular sources of data on mass shootings in the US that are utilized by scholars, journalists, policymakers, and more. And we asked a simple question. Here we're looking at mass shootings that are in one, at least one of the five most commonly used databases. Um, and between the years of 2013 and 2020, those are years where we have data in all five of these databases. Um, Added up, there are 3,582 incidents that are included in at least one database between those years. But we asked how many are included in all of them? The figure that you're looking at is called an upset plot and it's sort of a fancy version of a, of a Venn diagram. Those are the plots that are often depicted with three overlapping circles. But here we have five circles. Along the bottom, you can see the five databases. The top one is listed as MJ, which stands for the Mother Jones database produced by the news magazine. Below that is Everytown. Everytown is a database produced by Everytown for Gun Violence, an organization that emerged following Sandy Hook to get better data on gun violence in the US. ASR, 
refers to the FBI's active shooter report that emerged under um, President Obama. Below that is SHR, you don't have to remember these, <laughs> um, which refers to the FBI supplementary homicide report data. That's actually the most common source of data utilized by scholars studying mass shootings. And then at the bottom, GVA refers to Gun Violence Archive, the database Tara just spoke about. There's some differences in the definitions that each of these databases uses. So for instance, Gun Violence Archive defines mass shootings in the way we do that Tara just explained by the numbers of people either injured or killed rather than only by the numbers of people killed. And that accounts for the reason that there are so many more incidents in that database than the others. And when you look along the bottom of the graph at the collections of purple dots here, um, that, that tells you the overlaps between databases. So the column on the far left that's taller than all of the others, those are the incidents that are in the gun violence archive database. Um, that aren't in any of the others. 2,727 incidents that are in the GVA database that none of the other databases acknowledge. Next to that, um, you see the FBI active shooter report includes an additional 93 incidents that are in that database, but no others. 84 incidents are included in the supplementary homicide report, but aren't included in any others. And if you move your eyes all the way over to where you see the five purple dots stacked above one another connected by a line. Those are the number of incidents that are in all five of these databases, 25. 25 of 3,582 3, incidents are in all five databases. So how many mass shootings there are in the US depends on which database you're consulting. Here's the same data. But here I'm only including incidents that meet this more narrower fatality threshold. So here we're looking at the same databases, but we're only looking at incidents in which four or more people were both shot and killed in the same incident. And so the overall numbers are a lot lower, but this shows us that it's still the same 25 incidents that are in all five databases. The rest of the incidents are in some databases of mass shootings, but absent in others. And because all of these databases are often used to claim that they represent all of the mass shootings in the United States, it's actually extremely uncommon to run checks on discoveries that are found in one database, but not in others. This means that virtually everything we know about mass shootings should be understood as partial knowledge. Despite this, there are some things that we do feel confident that we know. So for instance, this figure combines all five of those databases I just discussed in the last two slides. And here, we're just interested in showing how many incidents happened each month in each year between 2013 and 2020. And there's two things that you should be able to gather from this figure. One is that mass shootings are socially patterned by time of year. Like other homicides, mass shootings are more common in the summer months. That's why the columns get taller in the middle of the, each year. Those columns represent May, June, July, and August. And then the other fact that appears true, even over this short period of eight years, is that mass shootings are happening more frequently. While they're still rare events, they happen more in the United States than anywhere else on Earth, and they're increasing in frequency. I'll just note really quickly that 2020 obviously was the first year that the pandemic hit in the United States. And while many mass shooting scholars suspected, Tara and I included, that mass shootings might decline during that period, our database actually showed that they increased. And one of the reasons for that is that we include family and intimate partner violence. One of the big findings that we found in mass shootings during the pandemic is that mass shootings didn't decline, they migrated. They were more likely like other forms of violence to take place in, inside of people's homes. Because we have so many more incidents in our database than most others as a result of how we define mass shootings, we're also able to look for patterns that are, are just not possible to look for with smaller databases. So this figure shows the number of mass shootings between 2013 and 19 in our database compared against the state population. Each one of the dots that you're looking at is an individual state in the US. The higher up it is on the figure, the more mass shootings happen in that state in the period we're looking at. And the farther the dot is to the right, the larger the state population. 
So that means that this figure shows us that states with more people have experienced more mass shootings. And that makes certain kind of sense. More people might simply make it more likely that somebody might act out in this way. But we're really interested in looking at differences in different state populations in a similar way to the way that people look at sexual education and various kinds of outcomes associated with different sex educations offered in different states. We can talk about this more in the Q&A. But to give you a sense of what this might help us learn, consider this. So here's the same data. Um, each, or each of these uh, individual dots are states. But rather than compare it against state populations, here we're comparing it against the percent of the state population that are gun owners. And one thing you might note is that there's a negative relationship here. So states with the lowest numbers of mass shootings have the highest share of people in their states that are gun owners. So if you look in the bottom right corner of this graph, Montana, Alaska, and Wyoming, these are the states with the largest percentages of people living in those states own guns, but they have some of the lowest rates of mass shootings in our data. And one thing that we're able to do with our data or one thing we're looking into is why something like that would be the case. Lastly, compared in another way, um, we can try to look at the estimated total number of guns in a state by number of mass shootings. And here the data look a little different. While the last one showed the percentage of the population that are gun owners in each state, this one's just looking at raw numbers. How many guns are there in a state? Texas is the farthest over to the right, which means that it's the state with the, with the largest estimated total number of guns. Um, it doesn't have the highest number of mass shootings, but again, we do see a positive correlation here. So we can start to ask questions about why this is the case, why we tend to see more mass shootings in some locations than other locations, even inside the same society. And I'm going to pass it over to Tara now. So um, this sort of leads to the question of why, right? So why are mass shootings occurring more frequently in the United States than in any other nation? Um, and so there's lots of different um, explanations for this and lots of people, obviously, you know, especially in the media, like talking about various aspects of the United States, the fact that, we, you know, the United States has a lot of guns. Um, but of course, other, there are other countries that have a lot of guns as well, not as many as the United States does. Um, but so rather than talking specifically about guns or gun laws, um, we, in, in our work, we, we talk about gun culture and sort of the unique gun culture that exists in the United States. And when we say gun culture, we're typically, what we mean is we're sort of referring to specific historic and contemporary attitudes, the norms, the laws um, surrounding gun ownership and use. So how are people using guns? How do they think about the guns that they own? Why, are, why do they own guns? Why do people feel like they want to own them? Um, we you know, learned about the, the recent law in Iowa of, that was sort of protecting gun ownership. Um, and so gun culture just encompasses the meanings attributed to guns within a specific cultural setting. Um, and so there's been some research on this, like other scholars, you know, heavily discuss um, gun culture. Um, and so if you think about like the types of guns that exist in the United States and the types of weapons that are, you know, often used in these types of shootings. Um, so you know, the, I, the difference between long guns, so we think about rif rifles or hunting guns versus handguns, for example. Um, and so long guns and handguns have like different meanings and uses. And in the United States, right, more people own handguns than, than long guns, for example. Um, so, and we also think about like, why people own guns. There's been a recent shift to people owning guns for a specific purpose, like sort of instrumental, right? Using guns for hunting to this idea of owning guns for personal protection. Um, and so this is sort of, and, and the use of guns as this, you know, um, as a way to defend, 
yourself or your family against this perceived you know, external harm. And so these are some of the things that we're starting to look at in the United States. So what does US gun culture look like and how is it different from say other countries like Canada or Israel that you know that also have high um, levels of gun ownership but don't necessarily have high levels of gun violence. And I'll just briefly say, I know some of you have read this because some of you are in Dr. Butterfield's class. We um, sometimes people ask, you know, um, two questions about mass shootings that, that they conflate into one question. Why do American men commit mass shootings more than people everywhere else in the world? And two of those questions, which maybe we'll get into in the Q&A, uh, we, we argue ought to be separated from one another. One of them is why are mass shootings almost always committed by men? And the second question is why do men in the US commit these crimes more than men anywhere else in the world? Um, that's one question that we're starting to look into. And it could be that there's different answers for different groups of men that commit mass shootings in the United States. This is ongoing because we're still in the process of cleaning this database. But I'm gonna stop for there now so we have time for um, the Q&A. And thanks so much everyone for listening to the short presentation. Thank you so much. That was a, a lot of, of really interesting uh, information uh, about your new data set um, and really starting to think about what we might learn from that, right? So I, I have some questions that I'd like to go and welcome the audience to continue to put uh, questions in the chat. But I guess one of the first things that strikes me is why are these databases so different? <laughs> Right. Like what what's going on with is the, the politics of this or, or, you know, have you looked at why why are we getting this different? You know, why, why is this such a definitional challenge? I can start. Do you want me to start that one, Tara? Um, so uh, one reason is that I think mass shootings is something that was initially like a, an idea that was coined by the media and then scholars started seeking to study it. But there wasn't an, a definition already in place, and you know, social scientists we we talk about this as operationalization of like figuring out like what are the parameters of the thing that you're studying in the first place. And um, I think one thing that was unique about Tara and I coming in to study this phenomenon is that neither of us sort of I don't know became scholars to start studying mass shootings. And as a result of that, maybe things that people take for granted within that scholarly community we just didn't take for granted. So for instance, everybody took for granted that there's an FBI definition of what the FBI refer to as mass murders, which are these incidents involving four or more people killed in a single location by a single person. And scholars started using that, but only collecting the gun related crimes as like a definition of mass shooting. So mass murder, according to the FBI by firearm. And um, it just became one way of kind of gaining some purchase on this sort of slippery idea. And then I think data sets became proprietary and different groups became invested in different ideas. And the problem with this is that whatever you want to say about mass shootings in the United States, there's probably a database for you to help support that claim. Uh -huh. If you want to say they're common, you should consult Gun Violence Archive and our data because we show that they're common. If you want to say that they're really rare, there's a database for you. If you want to say that they're almost only committed by white men, there's a database for you. Um, and that's really problematic because mm -hmm. I think that lots of people, when they hear data on, on, a, on a data, you know, data from a database that includes all of the mass shootings in the United States show us the following, it sounds like, well, this is what we know. But what we know varies radically by which database we're using to know those things. Okay, mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, so I wanna get into the issue of masculinity just a little bit. And I know you're starting to parse some of this out. Um, you both discussed it as connected with masculinity. And so I'm hoping you can elaborate on that a little bit uh, in some more detail. And then, what does it mean for us if we're going to say that 
we should look at masculinity as something that's integral to mass shootings. Like, why does that matter? How can that help us better understand this? I can Sorry, that's a big question. <laughs> it is a big question. Um, why don't I start and then I'll pass it to you to talk about the connection between gun culture and masculinity, Tara. Is that okay? Yes. Um, so, so one way that we answered this question of like, why is it that men commit these crimes more than um, more than women? Like, why is it so disproportionately masculine? Criminologists of gender who study crimes like this look for crimes that are sort of disproportionately committed by one gender or another. Um, and they make the argument that crimes that are disproportionately one gender or another are actually better understood as enactments of gender than just crimes themselves. So just to give you an example of something like that, the criminologist Jack Katz often uses the example of a really disproportionately feminine crime in the United States is petty theft. Um, that petty theft is committed more by women than it is by men. And if you if you look at Jack, what Jack Katz argues, he argues that what are women stealing? It's often young women stealing markers of femininity. They steal makeup. They steal clothing. They're stealing ways of accomplishing their gender. Um, and disproportionately masculine crimes in the US are things like the stick up. If you hold a gun up to somebody and say, give me your wallet or empty the cash register, um, that's a crime that's almost only committed by men. And so one way of looking at that is saying that that actual action is also a way that people are accomplishing masculinity. And Tara and I have suggested mass shootings are sort of productively understood this way too. So in the chapter that some of the audience have uh, read and I'm sure others haven't, one thing Tara and I go into is the social psychological literature on what's referred to as masculinity threat. And there's this body of scholarship that bring mostly actually college students, because that's who social psychologists study, um, into labs, and they experimentally threaten some of their gender identities. And by and what they actually do, if you're interested, they um, it, the most typical way this is done is uh, men will come into a lab and they take uh, some sort of a test that they're told this will measure your gender identity. And afterwards, some of them have their gender identity confirmed. So some of them are told, oh, you tested in the masculine range and others have their, their uh, gender identity challenged in some way. So some of them are told, you, you, your results show that you're slightly in the feminine range. And then they give them a bunch of different questions to see if they respond differently de depending on whether their gender was confirmed or threatened. And it turns out threatened men reach for a really, um, common collection of things. So if you threaten men's masculinity, research has shown that they're more likely to say that they want to buy an SUV. They're more likely to tell you that they are that they vote Republican. Um, but they're also more likely to support male supremacist statements like, I believe men are inherently superior to women. They're more likely to support violence as a resolution to problems. Um, and what that body of scholarship shows us is that masculinity is, is a slippery concept. It sometimes feels like it's easier to define than, um, than it actually is. And sometimes when scholars look at things like that, we look at the research that shows like when we, when we experimentally take that identity away from someone, what do they reach for? And sometimes that's how we can find out what an identity is comprised of. And in, in this case, research has really documented that men reach for violence sometimes to demonstrate masculinity when they don't feel like they have access to it anymore. And that might be one reason that men are committing mass shootings more than women, but it doesn't explain, which I'll let Tara talk about, um, it doesn't explain why American men are doing right. this more than men in other places. Right. Good, because that was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and it's difficult, right, to even think about like American culture or American gun culture, right, when you're talking about a large, very diverse, right, country. And so we sort of talk about that there can be like even pockets of different, um, and when Tristan was, you know, showing the data that more, you know, per the percent gun ownership doesn't necessarily mean that there's more mass shootings in a particular state. Um, and as we're, we go through the data, we'll be able to look at, you know, the country versus states versus county level data. 
Um, but some research has found a, a connection, right, between white men who've recently experienced economic setbacks, setback, setbacks for example, um, who, you know, then are more likely to sort of reach, like if you're mas thinking about masculinity threat, you know, Tristan talks about it sort of in a lab setting, and this is in, in you know, in the real world, um, that they're more likely to see a gun and view it as this sort of replacement or, um, you know, owning a gun as empowering. You can think about um, the ad for the for the rifle that the Sandy Hook shooter used. Um, they now I think believe that company is now bankrupt, but they had an ad with a picture of the AR-15 or a similar gun and that all the ad said was consider your man card reissued. Um, and that ad ran right before, so that ad was running in late 2012. And it's interesting to think about, you know, a man card and that it needs to be reissued, you know, as if, you know, something has been taken away, right? That the perception of, you know, especially white American men, that something has been taken from them and that, you know, this is sort of a way to get it back. Um, and also this idea that I sort of briefly mentioned in the, in the talk of shifting from guns as tools, which I think is how, you know, I think the NRA really likes to talk about guns as, oh, they're just a, a tool that people use. And that may be true, but increasingly we're seeing them as, you know, not just being tools for hunting or sport even, but as these like symbol, you know, masculine symbols that men reach for. Um, and this idea of protection, right? Of protecting your family or your right, you know, that guns are needed um, to sort of protect something that will otherwise be lost. Um, and some of Tristan and my work that we did with some co-authors, um, we found that, you know, although there's this protection language around guns and why we need to protect, you know, the right to, to bear arms has to do with protection, um, we found that, you know, men who are, you know, men who are parents or who are married are not more likely to own guns. So it's sort of you know, kind of throws a wrench in that argument that uh, that's why people are, that's why men are owning guns or that's why they need guns is, is for protection. So it's less about protecting your family and more about, you know, protecting your masculinity. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so a couple of questions kind of just to build on that. So you talked about, you know, looking at the different data sets and the correlation between the number of owners in one case, right, of gun owners versus just the raw number of guns. And I'm wondering if there's, one, actually one of the students has asked, if you're looking at that in regional terms, right, is there some regional data emerging that might help us explain, like, are there parts of our country, like, you know, places that have more economic distress or something like that, that can help us uh, explore those. And if you have any preliminary findings or hypotheses around that kind of regional and economic uh, dislocation, that kind of aggrieved entitlement, I think is, is, is some of the language that I've heard around that. I can speak really briefly to that. So um, whoever that student is, that's a great question. Wish you were our research <laughs> assistant. <laughs> um, so, so that's a question that sort of Tara and I are really looking into. Lots of the scholarship that uses this phrase gun culture um, has kind of assumed that gun cultures kind of evenly blanket a national population. So it'll say, lots of scholars will say, as, as we just did, that the United States has a gun culture that's distinct from other gun cultures around the world. And there's tons of ways that we can make that argument. And I believe that it's true. So for instance, the United States is the most gun owningest population in the world. There are more guns per capita in the US than anywhere else. But even if you've ever heard that fact before, you might not know just how true it is. Um, we have more guns per capita than anywhere else in the world, but we have so many more um, that it's sort of silly. We're actually the 
I think right now the most recent data show that we have about 120 guns for every 100 people in the United States. And that makes us the only nation in the world where there are more guns than humans. And the next nation is something like 30 guns per capita. So there's just a, a, a huge gap. Um, but, uh, you know, one question is, is that gun culture true of everyone? Like all, all of you listening, you probably are aware of people who you feel like, gosh, I know people who are who would never own a gun and maybe feel really hostile to gun ownership. And so it, it's strange to suggest that a gun culture at the national level is representing everyone. Um, it's really hard to break it down. Like, is your gun culture different from my gun culture, different from her gun culture, et cetera? Uh -huh. But we're trying to kind of create a more granular way of looking at this. And one way of doing that is by breaking it down by state. And this has been done, um, I, I very briefly brought it up in, in the talk referring to research on sex education. So, you know, the, the awful thing about sex education in the United States is that, um, well, there are many awful things. One awful thing about sex ed in the United States is that it's taught different ways in different states. You might live in a state where the only sex education that you were provided is abstinence only, which means that there were some teacher or teachers who told you don't have sex, that's your sex ed. In other states, you get a little bit more information. And in other states, you can get some more sort of comprehensive forms of sexual education. And what scholars looking at sex education have done is asked, okay, so depending on what kind of information is offered to young people, like we can look at different outcomes, like rates of transmission of sexually transmitted infections or rates of teen pregnancy, or, and we can ask what happens when you, when you create dramatically different sexual cultures. Uh -huh. um, and similarly, it might be the case that different states have different gun cultures. So the, the state with the largest share of gun owners, just percentage of the popul state population who own guns is Wyoming. And Wyoming is also the least populous state. So there are the fewest people in that state when compared with any other state. Uh -huh. But I think in our database, they only have one incident, one mass shooting that occurred between 2013 and 19 data that we showed. Um, and one reason for that could be, well, there's just fewer people who could have committed it. But another reason could be that guns in Wyoming mean something different than guns do in other places. And sometimes when we present these data, people will say, oh, so guns aren't a problem. And what Tara and I often say to that is, well, guns don't produce that problem in Wyoming, but the issue in the United States isn't that mass shootings are the gun problem. It's that we have lots of different gun problems and mass shootings are one of them. So awesome. rates of firearm related suicide are huge in Wyoming. And in fact, lots of scholarship has shown that when states pass laws like Iowa just did, um, when guns become easier to access, we see rates of firearm related suicide go up and those things um, actually harm uh, older white men the most. Um, so to say that, you know, there are fewer mass shootings in states that have more of a maybe hunting culture. Um, it is true that this gun problem might be lower in those states, but there are other gun problems that are exacerbated by those very same gun cultures as well. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so much to think about here. Um, one of our audience members has asked a question about the different types of guns and in, you know, what ways that their question specifically was about high powered guns. And I, I assume the relationship with, with mass shootings and that kind of uh, situation, but just more broadly, you know, what kinds of questions are you asking about uh, accessibility, right? And the, then the, also types of weapons. I guess that's kind of a two part question. I can start. Um, it's difficult. So, um, you know, when you look at, especially when you look at state level data and you might report things about state and different gun laws in a state, but of course states are porous. So, you know, there was that uh, horrifying shooting in the Buffalo grocery store and the manipulations that the perpetrator did to his gun are illegal in New York, but he was able to go to Pennsylvania, which was an one hour drive south of where he was, by get everything he needed to turn his, you know, turn it into a semi 
semi-automatic um, that was able to fire a lot, you know, many rounds in a short amount of time. Um, and so it's sort of difficult to, to really determine, you know, the impact of particular gun laws in, mm -hmm in places right. right so people often i think um you know pro-gun groups will often point to chicago and say illinois has some of the strictest gun laws in the country but yet it's surrounded by you know states that have relatively few restrictions so we can't really we can't really say with that much certainty how much these different laws and rules, like the, we have a lot stricter rules surrounding handguns than we do, you know, these, what are called these, uh, what people, the media typically calls assault rifles. Um, because for a long time, handguns were a source of this type, you know, of violence, especially the high, you know, homicide rates that we saw in the 90s. Um, and so it's actually, you know, in some states you have to be 21 to buy a handgun, but you can own an AR-15. Um, so anyway, so I guess it's just really difficult to sort of make a causal argument about gun laws and these types of incidents. Okay. But we're trying to. <laughs> <laughs> so one thing, as we sort of try to measure, like, what is, a, how does gun culture related to this? We're, some of the questions that we're asking are, how does gun legislation change in states? And do we see a meaningful change in the frequency of mass shootings after legislative changes? Um, so we're starting to kind of look into some of those things. The other thing that's sort of related to the question that the student asked is, um, you know, does, is, Definitely type of gun is related to sort of what a, what a mass shooting incident looks like. Um, so incidents that are inflicted by people with multiple guns or semi-automatic um, weapons include a lot more victims. And one thing that our data is showing so far, um, well, one thing that sometimes people don't realize is that you know, most of the data that are collected on mass shootings are collected like we do from news media articles. And so sometimes, you know, it's as much as is shared in the media is some of the best information that we have on these things. And so the media don't always share how many, how many uh, firearms were used and of what type. Um, they also, lots of these crimes are not fully solved. So when we have a database as big as ours, we have huge numbers of incidents where we actually don't know who did it. We know that someone, one or two people committed a crime, but it isn't fully solved yet, um, and, and it may not be. Um, one thing that we do know, we also don't know lots of basic demographic characteristics about um, perpetrators. Like we don't know the race of everyone in the database, but for the group of uh, perpetrators where we do know um, that they are men and what race they are, et cetera, it appears that white men committing mass shootings in the United States, their mass shootings are different than our other groups of men. And some of the ways that they're different is that it's, it's, uh, they're more likely to fall into a category that we're labeling random. And, and you may have heard of like random mass shootings discussed in the news media, but Tara and I have tried to kind of operationalize, like what does random mean? And so here we ask questions about, does this shooter have a relationship with the victims? Like, does the shooter know them? And then we also ask, does the shooter have a relationship with this location? Is there a reason that it happened here? Or does it really just feel more random? And white mass shooters are much more likely to be sort of classified by those qualities as committing random crimes. And mm -hmm. you know, on average, um, shootings committed by white perpetrators in our database tend to have higher victim counts. And that might mean that they're using different types of guns, mm -hmm. but we aren't always able to get as much information about firearms as, as we'd hoped initially when we started this. Yeah, so one of the questions I wanted to ask was kind of about these inter intersections between ideas about masculinity and race and particularly, you know, shootings that are clearly targeting um, other communities, right? Like the Buffalo grocery store, like the rise in anti-Semitic violence we're seeing, like the, um, you know, the shooting in Georgia that uh, targeting Asian Americans, like are in your data set, are you able to, are you looking at like what, what who, who is doing this, right? Who are these, who are these perpetrators? 
uh, and, and ideas about you know what's going on um, with those situations. I can take that one. But so those in our database are incidents that would qualify as terrorist, domestic terrorist incidents, where they've been committed against a group because members are of that group. Um, and those are almost only committed by white men. It's not only, but the vast majority of them. And I think a lot of times people hear about mass shootings and they think that all mass shootings in the US are committed by white men. With our more broad definition, including family, intimate partner, gang, drug, et cetera, violence, we find that they're committed by men, but actually white men account for the share of them that we would expect based on white men's share of the population of men in the United States. Um, but they're overrepresented among certain types of crimes. So the terrorist crimes, they're overrepresented. They're overrepresented among the high fatality and injury count crimes. They're overrepresented among the scariest types of mass shootings that we're having, I think. Okay. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Um, and this comes from a physician who's on our, our board. Do you have information about the healthcare costs of the victims who survive gun violence? This may be totally out of your wheelhouse, but an interesting question. Um, and whether within a situation of homicide or suicide. So we don't, you don't have to have all the answers. <laughs> yeah. So the question is asking, like, do we have information about the cost to individuals like who are surviving? These right. Like, what is this? The What are the medical costs, I assume, of sure. gun violence in our country? Like this is looking at another angle of the price that we're all paying. Yeah. No, I think that's a, I think that's a great question. We do not have data on that. But I do think it's an important, um, a really important question thinking about like sort of as I, I love it because it's sort of another reason why we should care. Because um, of course we should care because we're humans and we should be, you know, care that this type of violence is happening. Um, but maybe we should also care because it's an incredible cost to individuals, but probably an incredible cost. And I'm not even talking about the phys the emotional and mental and cost, but just economic cost to and burden on our healthcare system, insure, you know, all, all of that. And I can imagine that the cost is extraordinary. Uh -huh. And I can say one thing that we're looking at that's like related, which I think it's a great question because I think it helps us to better assess the scale and scope of this type of gun violence. Um, one thing that we're looking at, so we have a, a small group of those incidents that we talked today that are school shootings. And the thing about schools in the United States is that we just collect so much data on schools, what a student body looks like, how many of them are attending school, how many of them are on free lunch, et cetera. And we're connecting our database with data from the National Center for Education Statistics. Oh, so that like it's a, there is an actual number, what's the healthcare cost? Um, we don't know what it is, but that's a number that I think can reach like larger constituencies just to talk about how large this is. There's another number that asks how many students attended a school where a school shooting happened. And we don't know what that number is yet, but we're gonna find out. And that's a much larger number than the number of school shootings that happen. And I think it's a better reflection of kind of how these tear apart the cultural fabric of communities. Mm -hmm. um, so I really appreciate that question because we're always looking for ways of communicating the scale of the issue. And I think that's a great, that's a great way of thinking about it. Yeah. Well, I can't thank you uh, enough for your willingness. I know we have two hour time difference. So you were up a little earlier uh, to meet with us and to share your really fascinating research and, you know, the questions it's going to help us uh, to, to think about and to answer and, and to reflect on and maybe go about how we can create that safer and more secure social and international order because without that we don't we don't have the right to enjoy all these other rights um, that we deserve and inherently possess as human beings so thank you uh for coming on today before we hang up i'm going to have erica bring up some of the other stuff we have on deck um and we hope that those of you in attendance uh, can join us for that so please mark your calendars to join us wednesday november 16th for a live event uh, in the old Capitol Senate chamber.
Alexander McLean, founder and CEO of Justice Defenders, formerly of the African Prisons Project, will speak on reimagining criminal justice systems. Then Thursday, we have the distinguished honor to present a lecture by the Chief Justice of the Kenyan Supreme Court. Um, they're visiting uh, with us right now. Um, we will be hosting the Honorable Martha Kume, in which we, she will share her vision for the court in her talk titled Social Transformation Through Access to Justice. And that's at three o'clock this Thursday in the Papa John Business Building. And then finally, the semester will close out uh, with an event honoring, as we always do, International Human Rights Day. And our director, Dean Adrian Wing, will moderate a conversation uh, about reparations on Wednesday, December 7th, and that will be uh, a Zoom event. You'll be able to find today's program as well as all of our previous webinars on the UI Center for Human Rights YouTube channel. You can stay up to date about center programming by joining our mailing list, which you can do on the website and by following us on social media. And finally, here's a pitch. If you enjoyed today's webinar and the work that the center does and want to contribute to our ability to sustain quality programming, please consider establishing a monthly recurring donation by visiting our website. Recurring donations of just $10 per month make a huge, huge difference. So thank you finally to the attendees for taking time out uh, to share your lunch hour with us. And we hope to see you at an event soon. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye.